Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless spots collecting information about you the moment you walk in the door customers may be surprised to know stores could be using biometric surveillance as a way to ward off shoplifters now it's raising privacy concerns do you ever feel like somebody's watching you but well, when you head to the store they just might be as a growing number of retailers are turning to technology to crack down on crime and this morning new questions and concerns over shoppers privacy Stressed out, John 20 years ago, it was the technology you'd only see in the movies, like Tom Cruise's Minority Report. He's been identified on the Metro. But now, it's being used in some supermarkets. To be honest, I didn't even see it because the door was open, right? So with the door being open, yeah, I wouldn't have noticed. Fairway Grocery Store is posting this sign on their New York City locations, saying they're collecting customers' biometric identifier information, like eye scans and voice prints, surveillance technology that has some shoppers shocked. You know, it's freaky. It is freaky. Fairway telling ABC News, this technology is helping our stores reduce retail crime, an industry-wide challenge that has increased dramatically over the last few years. This is not a city where you can walk into a store, take what you want. In 2021, retailers lost about $95 billion, mostly from external theft, and found these incidents are becoming increasingly more violent. But how do you know if you are being tracked? And could this come to a store near you? We see that in the vast majority of the country, there isn't a protection against this sort of biometric surveillance. You don't even have to be told when it's being done. Now companies in over a dozen confirmed stadiums across the country are turning to tech to help curb it. In New York City, signs like these are mandated by companies who are collecting customers' biometric identifier information. On Thursday, Amazon was hit with a proposed class action lawsuit alleging it failed to post those signs at its Amazon Go retail stores in New York City when it collected information by scanning customers' palms and bodies. And questions remain about the accuracy of biometric surveillance technology. Then there's the issue of privacy. If someone steals your biometric identity, you can't change your iris scan or your face. When this information is inevitably hacked, people's privacy is going to be compromised for the rest of their lives. Amazon telling ABC News it does not use facial recognition technology and customers who use Amazon One, which is their palm based contactless identity and payment service, are provided the appropriate privacy disclosures during the enrollment process. The customer is always in control of when they choose to be identified using their palm. You never know who or what is watching. There is a coming world dictator known as the Antichrist, who is foretold of in the Bible who in the near future will control a worldwide government, a worldwide monetary system, and a worldwide religion. He will use surveillance technology to control the peoples of the world. Is he living now? Probably. Is the Antichrist already working behind the scenes to bring about his plan for world economic and political domination? It seems so. From all indications, the Antichrist satanic technology-based system is already being set in place. He will use technology to achieve and enforce his near total control of the world and its people, and they don't even see it coming. Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Tonight, the Pentagon says it's ahead of schedule to send Patriot missiles and Abrams tanks to Ukraine. U.S. training of Ukrainian troops is moving faster than expected. And it comes as we saw Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping standing shoulder to shoulder today, an alliance the White House is calling a marriage of convenience. Choreographed pageantry for the world to see. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin issuing their joint statement on Ukraine. Jieding. China remains impartial, said she, on the side of peace and right side of history. China's plan could form a basis for a settlement, said Putin, but the West and Kyiv are not ready for it. That plan has been derided by the West for not demanding Russia's military to withdraw. She attempting to act as peacemaker in the war, yet never condemning Putin's invasion. The two authoritarian leaders side by side, further trying to present themselves as a twin counterweight to U.S. influence in the world. It looks like the West indeed intends to fight Russia until the last Ukrainian, said Putin. Russia will respond accordingly. While world powers talked around Ukraine, inside the war-torn country, President Vladimir Zelensky paid his respects to fallen soldiers, while Ukrainians bear the brunt of constant Russian shelling. What's your day-to-day -day life here? What do you do when you wake up before you go to bed? We ask God to save the city for fewer deaths, says Lilia. It's very scary because people die every day just going about their business. Chinese President Xi wrapping up his visit to Moscow with an ominous warning to the West, telling Putin, quote, change is coming that hasn't happened in 100 years, and we are driving this change together. Please take care, dear friend. And while their growing alliance may seem pretty obvious, the White House disagrees. I wouldn't go so far to call it an alliance. Yesterday I called it a marriage of convenience, because that's what I think it is. In President Xi? President Putin sees uh, a potential backer here. He needs help from President Xi, and that's what this visit was all about. I laughed out loud when John Kirby said, after a five-hour meeting with Xi and Putin, and now Putin is traveling to see Xi. I mean, this is a long-distance relationship, but it's gotten very close. This is not an alliance? In some ways, Laura, it may be actually be better than some of our own alliances where our allies actually don't pull their weight, uh, to be totally frank. I mean, this, by any historical standard, this is absolutely an alliance. I don't know what it means to, to dismiss it as an, a marriage of convenience. I mean, the Chinese are propping up the Russian economy. They, they associated themselves with the Russian position on the Ukraine conflict. We see the Russians moving towards uh, yuanization, more reliance on the yuan. So I think this is a very deep and abiding uh, alliance. And to your point, there's a, there's a very close personal relationship that's very evident between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. If you look at the body language, it's very clear. And if you look at, at the fact that this is Xi Jinping's first foreign visit since COVID, and he goes someplace for three days, and then he invites Vladimir Putin to come visit him. I mean, we are definitely dealing with a very, uh, probably the closest Sino-Russian relationship, certainly back to the, probably the 1950s and maybe even uh, beyond that. Balance of power geopolitically does what? When our economy continues to go down the tubes under Biden, and these two are teaming up. What you want to avoid in American foreign policy is China and Russia coming together. If you go back to Kissinger, et cetera, we always sought to have to, to divide them apart. These are the two massive Eurasian land powers. China's now an economy of roughly our own size. Russia's a very dangerous country. And, you know, now they're basically in the position in which, you know, the Chinese are clearly preparing to use military action. We don't know what they're going to do, but they're talking openly about it. New this morning, North Korea has launched multiple cruise missiles into the Sea of Japan. That's according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the timing is significant as the largest set of U.S. and South Korea war games in five years comes to an end today. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Seoul, South Korea. Josh, good morning. So this is the first time in several years the U.S. has ramped up its military drills with South Korea. You spoke to some of the soldiers on the ground there today. What exactly did they tell you? Those military drills had to be scaled back uh, several years ago, first uh, under former President Trump when he was pursuing diplomacy with Kim 
Jong-un and then uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But the threat has really not gone away, as uh, you can see from those cruise missiles launched just today uh, that you were mentioning. In fact, last year, North Korea launched uh, more than 70 missiles, the most of any year, and their weapons programs are only developing even further, according to U.S. military officials. And I spoke uh, at the beginning of today's live fire exercises with Lieutenant Drew Scott, who's been serving for about a half a year here in South Korea. Uh, he is from New Canaan, Connecticut, and he told me about the stakes of these exercises. Listen. How does it feel to be practicing for a potential conflict just 20 miles south of the DMZ? So, you know, we got to go up to the DMZ and kind of look into North Korea and, and essentially see all their defenses. Um, it brings a lot of gravity to the table for sure. Um, but I think, especially with the men, they really understand that, you know, while we're here, there's a very serious mission uh, and that any sort of aggression that comes from the North is, is really what we're here to counter. Yeah. Do you feel ready if conflict were to break out here tonight? 100%, absolutely. Now, the U.S. says that these exercises are completely defensive in nature, Zinkley. They say that it is critical that they rehearse the skills they would have to actually use uh, in the most realistic way possible uh, if it actually came to defending uh, the peninsula. And today we watched uh, as they really deployed an array of military hardware from Apache attack helicopters to attack aircraft, all kinds of mortar and artillery, as well as for one of the first times, drones, Zinkley. Josh, notably, as you're saying that, I'm mindful that these drills are close to the border with North Korea and the proximity to the DMZ plays a huge role here. So what can you tell us about that and what it means for tensions with the North? I spoke with one of the commanders of today's exercises who said there's nothing that focuses uh, U.S. troops on their mission here, like the fact that they are sleeping every night roughly 10 miles from uh, the DMZ, that you know heavily fortified uh, area between North and South Korea. Uh, but the North Koreans, they are clearly very upset about these exercises, calling them a provocation. They believe it's a rehearsal for war. And just today, we heard from North Korea's foreign ministry blasting the U.S. position on this, saying that any effort to rid North Korea of its nuclear weapons would be tantamount to a declaration of war, Zinclay. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Since Idaho passed its 2020 ban on transgender athletes participating in girls, or women's sports in that state. More than a dozen other states have passed similar laws, while a handful of blue states are doing the exact opposite, enforcing laws that protect the ability of trans people who want to participate in athletic programs consistent with their gender identity, not the sex that they were assigned at, at birth. Vermont is one of those states, CNN's Bryn Gingrass is there, where one private Christian parochial school has been barred from competing in all sports after the girls' basketball team there refused to play against another team that had a transgender athlete. Vermont, one of the country's most progressive states, publicly debating a controversy involving kids that one state lawmaker says left her with disappointment in the adults. It happened in State Senator Rebecca White's district. Mid-Vermont Christian School forfeited a state tournament girls basketball game because the opposing team had a transgender player on its roster. The school arguing a, quote, very real issue of safety was at play. What followed? A swift and sweeping penalty against the school's athletic program by the state's governing body, the Vermont Principals Association. It banned the high school from all competition in all sports moving forward. Is that a bridge too far? No. I, I don't think it's a bridge too far. The athletes that we're talking about are unlikely to go on to some of the elite professional athletics. But that concept of discriminating against another young person, it causes long-term outcomes for trans youth because they're hearing rhetoric that is telling them that they're not valuable, that in fact they're dangerous. The VPA said the high school violated the state's policy of support of transgender student athletes and building an inclusive community for each student to grow and thrive. In response, Mid-Vermont Christian School wrote that it would be appealing the decision, adding, 
canceling our membership is not a solution and does nothing to deal with the very real issue of safety and fairness facing women's sports in our beloved state. But the on-court controversy has reignited debate about the inclusion and equity of transgender athletes. Vermont is one of only 10 states which are fully inclusive, something White says the states worked hard for. We're an inclusive state, we're a welcoming state. So it doesn't surprise me that we've had a situation where folks are pushing back against some of that inclusive work that we've done because it is innovative, it is bold, and it's important. Vermont is reaffirming its commitment to transgender youth, Jake, by passing a shield law in one chamber of its legislature just last week, which will safeguard gender-affirming uh, treatments done in the state like surgeries and hormone therapies. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The relentless weather in the West on this first week of spring, leaving parts of California underwater and without power. Rob Marciano starts our coverage in Santa Cruz County, California. This storm was indeed one for the March record books, came in with crazy amounts of rain and big time wind, taking out big time trees like this. Look at the size of this puppy crossing and blocking this road, taking out power lines, and there's countless trees like this down across the state. The center of this storm really intensified more than we thought it would. It bombed down. By the time it got to Santa Cruz and then the San Francisco Bay Area, it felt like a hurricane. This morning, torrential rains and ferocious winds causing chaos for commuters across California. Outside San Francisco, cars struggling to navigate floodwaters accumulating on Interstate 280. This Alaska Airlines flight forced to abort its landing in Monterey due to winds gusting over 70 miles per hour. Tens of thousands of people losing power. Cars not able to make it down the roads in Boulder Creek. Power lines and trees blocking the way. From L.A. to the Bay Area, people dealing with flooded homes, down trees, and washed out roads. We have saturated ground throughout the county. That takes out roads, and when the trees come down, that takes out wires. And at least two drivers were killed after trees fell onto their cars. Two lanes of a freeway in Livermore closed after a retaining wall began to give way. Concerns now with more rain, it could completely collapse. About 250 feet has to be replaced. A driver attempting to make it across a flooded road loses control. His car pulled into the rapid waters, able to escape, but rescue teams had to help him off a riverbank. Waves lashing the seawalls in San Francisco, nearly taking out this cyclist. Still over 100,000 people without power. The winds have calmed a bit, but you can see the rain is still coming down. Might even have some thunderstorms later on today in this very saturated and very battered state. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds and they swirl about being turned by his guidance that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. This parched earth should be filled with water. 
Spain has been experiencing drought conditions for 36 months. In this reservoir, the dry, cracked land looks more like a desert than an area meant for holding water. Buildings and structures submerged for decades are now being revealed as water levels drop. Villanova de Sao has been underwater since the 1960s, when the Catalonian government created a reservoir over the town that contained some thousand-year-old Roman ruins. In this drought, a church and other ruins have risen again. Three years of drought conditions are having economic effects on Spain as well. Leisure and tourism industries, like water sports, have taken a major hit, as well as agriculture. At the end of 2022, the Spanish government pledged about $25 billion to go towards modernizing their water management systems and investing in desalinated water for use in farming. According to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Spain and and other countries in the Mediterranean region are particularly sensitive to the impacts of climate change. Meteorologists in Spain are predicting another hot, dry summer, increasing the possibility of wildfires without the relief of rain in sight. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Now, the window of opportunity to beat climate change is rapidly closing. Extreme weather events will only get worse unless the world acts now to secure a livable future for all. The SOC predictions are outlined in a UN report that's expected to shape climate policy in the years to come. In every country, on every continent, the climate emergency is taking hold. This is Malawi, hundreds dead, hundreds of thousands displaced. The cause, a record-breaking cyclone. On the other side of the world, in Argentina, endless, brutal heat, compounding a drought with farmers facing losses estimated at $14 billion. So now we have this latest call to arms from the United Nations with what should become the fundamental policy document for shaping climate action. It is the distillation of years of work by hundreds of scientists. And these are the key points. In the past decade, there have been 15 times more deaths from droughts, floods and storms in more vulnerable regions. Carbon emissions, they need to drop, and rapidly. In fact, they need to cut by almost half in just seven years if global warming is to be limited to one and a half degrees Celsius. But a rapid and far-reaching transition could pull us back from the brink. And to help do that, developed countries need to stump up hundreds of billions of dollars every year to vulnerable nations, something they've so far failed to do. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting, as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him, and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today, as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Just over 140 years, the Earth's temperature has risen by 1.1 degrees Celsius. Heat waves, droughts and deadly floods are just a snippet of what awaits us as a result of global warming. The United Nations IPCC is releasing the final report from their sixth climate change assessment cycle on Monday. Our world is at the crossroads and our planet is in the crosshairs. We are nearing the point of no return, of overshooting the internationally agreed limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. We are at the tip of a tipping point. But it is not too late. I count on the IPCC to do what you have always done, point the way to solutions, and show the urgent need to end global heating with cold, hard facts. The world's top climate scientists and representatives of countries have spent a week in Switzerland condensing 10,000 pages of academic research from the last seven years into a 20-page warning for world leaders. It's a summary of all of their major reports featuring the science of climate change, current impacts of the climate crisis and potential solutions. Some of the warnings include at least 3.3 billion people will be affected by global warming. 
14% of species will face extinction if the Earth's temperature rises by 1.5 degrees, and by 2050, cities will be experiencing annual disasters that would have previously occurred every 100 years. Solutions recommend rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, with the collective aim of attaining a carbon-neutral world by 2050. Experts are warning that a lack of action could lead to irreversible changes to our planet in the long term. For climate scientists, this final report is their last chance to call for action before the next report in 2030, by which time it will be too late to act. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. At least 13 people have been killed and hundreds injured after a magnitude 6.5 earthquake shook huge swathes of Afghanistan and Pakistan on Tuesday evening, leading residents of Kabul to spend the night out in the streets in fear of going back indoors. In Islamabad, video footage shows scores of people fleeing offices and shopping centers when the quake struck. The earthquake comes nearly two months after the devastating 7.8 magnitude quake struck southeastern Turkey and northern Syria, killing around 51,000 people. The sheer force was clear to see, as this Pakistani newsreader informed viewers live on air as the earthquake struck. The 6.5 magnitude quake sparked scenes of panic on Tuesday evening. These people, who had been in a shopping centre in Islamabad, fled down stairwells as the building began to tremble. I was scared. I was literally shocked that I have witnessed that thing first time in my life. And I was thinking to, I just want to get outside of this building as soon as possible. It was very quickly all hands on deck at this hospital as the first casualties were brought in by emergency services. The quake, which lasted for around 30 seconds, could be felt from Central Asia to New Delhi in India, nearly 2,000 kilometres away from the epicentre near Germ in northeastern Afghanistan. Afghans in this village are in mourning after a child was killed. The father is still in shock. When we were rushing out, a wall of our house collapsed on the children. One of my children lost her life and three others were injured. When the villagers heard what happened, they all came to help. The number of casualties and the amount of damage have so far been less than feared. But the remoteness of some of the affected areas is likely to slow down rescue efforts. 
with reports of phone and internet links down in some places. Terrified people running in fear in downtown Guayaquil. The deadly earthquake, leaving at least 12 dead, felt early Saturday afternoon across the coast of Guayas region in Ecuador. Inside the supermarket, customers rushing outside, fearing for their lives. And these anchors reacting on live TV, getting up to evacuate the studio. The USGS reports a 6.8 magnitude with a shock centered 50 miles south of Guayaquil. In nearby Cuenca, a street covered in rubble falling from structures and smashing this white car, crowds desperately rushing in to help. The Ecuadorian government reporting at least one person dead trapped inside the vehicle. Solange Goyago was in her apartment nearby. And then all the windows started shaking a lot and all the lights uh, were moving so fast. In Machala, this pier sinking into the water along with an entire structure trapping people inside. The government says rescue teams have been sent to the area to help evacuate. A lot of people are scared. They have a lot of business closing right now, people crying. Initial government reports say the damage to structures includes homes, schools and hospitals, along with power outages for some of the affected areas. Isaiah 24, 19 through 21. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. Luke 21, 26 through 28 Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, Repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs 
on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.